Okay, hello everyone. I think we can get started now. Um, a warm welcome from me for those of you who are joining us perhaps, perhaps for the first time and don't know me yet. My name is Unherid Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. And uh, very glad to welcome all of you here uh, today. I see a number of familiar names um, in the chat room. Um, great to see you again. And please do uh, continue to introduce yourselves um, there in the chat. Um, uh, this, as you know, is uh, the next event in our series of expert uh, online briefings in the track on humanitarian law and policy. We'll be looking today at the subject of the so-called war algorithms, uh, exploring the legal implications of technical autonomy in armed conflict. This is drawing from a report that was recently published on the same subject by the Harvard Law School uh, PLAC, Program on International Law and Armed Conflict. Um, and hopefully, um, hopefully all of you have had a chance to take a look at some of the background materials. In particular, I can uh, uh, recommend the, the brief interview uh, with one of the port's authors, uh, which was very helpful, I thought, in, in framing uh, the particular importance of this subject, um, certainly from the perspective of humanitarian actors. Uh, but also others. So considering from the humanitarian actors' perspective um, that so much of their work often uh, is in relation to armed conflict situations, uh, looking at potential changes in the way, uh, fundamental changes in the way that war Wars are conducted uh, is certainly of fundamental uh, concern uh, to humanitarian action. And then potentially, uh, even the possibility that humanitarian actors themselves may uh, start to use parallel advancements uh, in technology uh, for the benefit of affected populations, uh, which makes building competence and, and really understanding some of the potential implications of these technological advancements all the more important. Um, so I uh, wanted to mention I'm very happy to be joined today by a co-host. Uh, Sasha Raiden is joining me today in the PHAP office. And uh, Sasha, perhaps I can ask you to, to come online and, and say a few words about yourself and, and your background. Thanks, and, and Herod. It's really nice to be here. Uh, just briefly give a little bit of background. I'm Editor-in-Chief of International Law Studies at the Stockton Center for the Study of International Law, which is at the US Naval War College uh, in Rhode Island. Um, the journal basically focuses on the intersection between international law and military affairs. And pertinent to today's event, we have published a number of articles on the issue of uh, autonomous weapons systems. So I'm really looking forward to today's event. Thanks. Excellent, and very good to have you uh, with me here today. Um, so thanks for being here, Sasha. Uh, uh, so now let's see. Without further ado, we can move into today's session. And I will ask Sasha if she wouldn't mind doing the honors to introduce our speakers. Definitely. Uh, welcome, Naz and Dustin. We're really excited to have you with us today. Um, and before starting, I'll just give a very brief introduction to you both. Uh, Naz Modirzadeh is the founding director of Harvard Law School's program on international law and armed conflict. She regularly briefs a variety of different agencies on issues related to international humanitarian law, human rights law, and counterterrorism regulations relating to humanitarian assistance. Her research focuses on intersections between these different bodies of law as well as Islamic law. Dustin Lewis is a senior researcher also at PLAC, or the Program on International Law and Armed Conflict. Um, he focuses on public international law and leads projects on international norms related to contemporary challenges concerning armed conflict. All right, thank you very much. And now, Naz, if you are there on the line, we'll hand over the, uh, the floor to you, or uh, over to Naz. 
Thank you so much, and Herod. Well, it is, as always, a real thrill for us to be here uh, joining not only uh, PHAP in Geneva, and of course, we're thrilled to be um, welcoming Sasha as well to this event, uh, which is a great addition to the group, uh, but of course, also all of the colleagues joining from around the world. Um, I'll just give a very, very brief word of introduction, and then I think the way we will proceed is I'm going to ask Dustin to give us the bulk of the substantive briefing on this research, on what we found, uh, and hopefully if the technology uh, powers that be work with us, we will be showing a number of videos to um, enhance the understanding of the topics for today. And then I'll close with some broader reflections, some of the dilemmas that we identified in doing this work, and kind of really um, think about what might be some of the ways in which this issue connects to humanitarian actors. Um, I think that sometimes topics uh, that involve intensive research and long papers can seem very far removed from colleagues who may be working on the Syria crisis or in Yemen, and there may be a question of, well, why would it matter to me that there's this debate in international law on such a, a niche topic? Uh, and so hopefully I can close with some reflections on why this might be something Thing that makes sense for humanitarian actors to at least have on their radar and see as an issue that in the years to come may be quite significant for humanitarian actors. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dustin, and he's going to do his best to kind of walk everyone through um, this rather extensive report that we published um, last month and give a sense of what is the nature of the debate on the issue of autonomy in armed conflict, what did we find in our research, and what are some of the key um, dilemmas or issues that arise when we look at the question of autonomy uh, playing a role in armed conflict today. Dustin, over to you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Naz, and thanks to the entire PF team for inviting us to present our research and to have this discussion today. As Naz mentioned, um, we're going to try to canvas a lot of material today in a rel relatively short time. All of it is drawn from the research report, um, and so I'd refer to that if you want a little bit more in-depth understanding of it. But very quickly, we're going to go over some of the technology, including hopefully with some videos. Uh, there we're going to highlight how there's these new learning uh, algorithms and architectures and we'll explain what that means and why that's important from an international law and accountability perspective with respect to armed conflict. Next, we're going to very briefly outline the main concerns of the debate concerning these new forms of what we're calling technical autonomy with respect to armed conflict. Uh, then I'll turn it back over to Naz. She's going to discuss what we mean by war algorithms and why we think focusing on algorithmic accountability might be a useful way to help frame what it is exactly that can be regulated or addressed, how it should be addressed, um, and through what different types of forms. Then lastly, we'll conclude with a few, discussion, a few elements concerning the dilemmas. Uh, not least with respect to humanitarian actors as these so-called battle space changes as more and more forms of technical autonomy are introduced to it. So as many of you know, there's huge amounts of uh, autonomy already in existing weapons platforms. And the, on the spectrum of weapons that are available today, you see, people, you see different commentators saying that autonomy exists, autonomy coming from the Greek for self-governance, that autonomy is not a one or a zero. It's not an on or an off necessarily. It's not necessarily a zero autonomy or full autonomy. These terms are not necessarily well understood, but that there's a very big spectrum of autonomy. Uh, today, especially with submarines and other uh, vehicle systems in terms of their ability to navigate uh, different areas, and then ultimately, as the biggest concern is, and as we'll discuss soon, is with respect to the capacity of these uh, systems to be able to identify potential targets and launch attacks with little to no human interaction after being launched is the main fulcrum of the debate. But so far, there's a huge amount of, um, uh, there's, on this spectrum of autonomy, there's very little understanding of what exactly we mean by uh, autonomy. And as we'll show in our intervention, I think one of the ways to look at it instead is to focus on the underlying algorithms that provide some of these levels of autonomy. One issue that came up in the report, and I think is very important to highlight, is that um, the underlying technology today is often developed initially in commercial or academic context. And then that's susceptible to both military 
and non-military use. The slide here shows the enormous amount of development that's taking place with respect to uh, machine intelligence or machine learning, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and how there's a, a huge amount of interest in this from academics as well as from commercial actors, and that often these then result in military applications, humanitarian applications, or applications for other individuals, organizations that are involved in armed conflict. Uh, so first, we like on our first video. We wanted to very briefly highlight one of the most advanced uh, robotic systems available today, which is called the Spot Mini uh, Robot by Boston Dynamics. So if you and you'll be able to adjust the volume on your player. So here's Spot Mini. Spot Mini is that first robot, and then behind it is the original Spot. This came out in, I believe, this summer. It's already had 5 million views on YouTube. Spot Mini is remotely controlled, but has the ability to navigate uh, its environment based on the inputs and the sensors that it utilizes, including, I believe, LiDAR, which is a laser-based form of uh, radar technology. And you can see the manipulator at the end are also what looks like its head, although one is, of course, not supposed to anthropomorphize uh, robots, uh, and there's a danger in it. So as you can see, the different abilities that Spot Mini has to be able to stand back up, to be able to use its um, the manipulator, to be able to put a glass into a dishwasher without breaking it, uh, all through remote control, and now you're going to see it gallop down the road a little bit. You can imagine the different um, applications in a commercial context, a medical context, um, an ability to act almost like a pack robot donkey of sorts. Um, and then we'll just keep this going right to the very end because as Marcus and I were joking about uh, yesterday, this is perhaps one of the most interesting parts of Spot Mini in its uh, sort of tussle with one of its founders to take back its uh, Diet Coke. Um, excellent, so that's Spot Mini. Spot Mini is one of the most advanced forms of what are called biped robots. Uh, this might, this has the real potential, so long as they can get the battery right. It's very hard to be able to provide battery power for a long period of time for these types of robots um, to be able to go forward. But focus of our report is on what we call constructed systems, however, instead of robots. We use this to sidestep the definitional quandaries of a robot because we don't think that the question of whether something's a robot or not is the most important one. Instead, we focus on constructed systems. These are systems that are built by humans. The ones that are of most concern for us are the ones that provide for a learning algorithm architecture and environment. Nas will explain that a little bit more later, but the key point here is that there's been an enormous amount of technological development with respect to how these systems can take in a lot of information through external sensors and then be able to compute that information and make quote unquote decisions or choices based on that information. These systems are increasingly operating in the quote unquote real world including with respect to the Google driving car, which you see here stuck in traffic in California. Another high profile um, an, uh, advancement came recently, and some of you may have heard this, with respect to what's called uh, AlphaGo, developed by Google DeepMind. This uses machine learning to be able to perform more and more uh, high level uh, functions that pre was pre were previously intractable within the artificial intelligence domains. 
AlphaGo beat one of the world's best uh, Go players, Go being a much harder form of a board game than chess. Uh, after the first two moves in chess, uh, there's about 400 possible moves, whereas in Go, there are about, after the first two moves, 130,000 possible moves. And the learning architecture and learning algorithms that Go used are immensely complex and ones that might be adapted for use in a number of commercial, military, and other contexts. And we'll explain those a little bit more later. Uh, next, though, we'd like to show the Super Aegis II, uh, short intro to it, which is a machine, stationary machine gun turret. It's called Super Aegis II and it's one of the most advanced weapon systems ever built. Built by its manufacturers, Dodam of South Korea, as a total security solution, the Super Aegis is an automated turret system that supports a variety of weapons, from a standard machine gun to a surface-to-air missile. It is designed to repel an attacker from up to three kilometers away, using sophisticated thermal imaging software and camera systems to lock onto a human-sized target, even in the dead of night. The system requires no human presence. It's all operated robotically from a distant control room. Dodam Systems Vice President Park Sung Ho says the high-tech weapon could become an integral component in South Excellent. So with the Super Aegis, we bring it up because among the 37 weapon systems that we highlight in the report that some commentators have said have a, um, a some autonomy, whether in navigation or in the ability to identify and possibly launch resulting attacks, uh, this is one that, while remotely controlled, does have uh, various forms of autonomy or automation. And these terms are not well defined and are quite uh, slippery once you get into it from a technical perspective. Um, it incorporates this machine gun turret, which is used primarily by South Korea in the demilitarized zone with a combination of digital cameras and thermal imaging to identify potential targets. Currently, it requires a human to authorize any use of lethal force, and before firing, it automatically emits a warning advising potential targets to turn back or we will shoot in Korean. Um, and if the target continues to advance, a remote human operator enters a password to enable the Aegis to shoot target. Again, this is in a um, the demilitarized zone a, that's not being used in urban combat today, and it's not what most people would consider to necessarily be fully autonomous, but there's certainly elements of autonomy or automation within the system, and ones that we think are very important to continue to scrutinize. Uh, next, we'd like to just very briefly highlight what's called the KMAX unmanned helicopter. The purpose of the KMAX cargo delivery program is to provide an air delivery asset to remove from the battlefield many of the convoys that have to be manned by hundreds of uh, Marine Corps folks to deliver the same kinds of cargo that are needed on a daily basis to support the troops in the remote areas of Afghanistan. We're trying to make a machine do the job that a man has put his life on the line to do many times over and take that risk, if you will, out of some of the mundane but required tasks that uh, combat. Excellent. So again, part of the reason for us to highlight KMAX helicopter is not only, of course, because it removes some of the risk for the uh, contractors for warring parties, but it could certainly have uses for humanitarian actors and others involved in humanitarian response and protection. It's an unmanned system that based on very sophisticated um, instrumentation, algorithms that are used um, with, to decide where to go, how quickly to go, et cetera, uh, could be used across a range of different functions for warring parties, uh, not only for humanitarian response, but then also up to and in, in including things like transporting uh, detainees or evacuating uh, those needing medical assistance. The key trends that we see in this area that the technology cuts across not only a land, but then there's enormous amount of development with respect to sea, uh, more and more with respect to air and even in outer space. 
as Nozzle highlight, there's not only the weaponized, but the non-weaponized variants, including the K-9 helicopter and these other forms of systems that would provide for different types of functions that can be grafted onto humanitarian response or protection, as well as the more just mundane logistical elements provided in armed conflict. There's also what's uh, a lot more miniaturization. And by that, of course, we just mean that make, the technologies are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, you'll see this in areas um, in technology such as drones, where you may have seen these quote unquote hummingbird sized drones um, and others. And the, the prices are dropping often precipitously in this domain. The one trend that I want to highlight very briefly is the perceived concerns around proliferation. And this is being used as one of the primary motivations for the US and other states to uh, develop and throw a lot of institutional, political, and monetary support behind the development of these autonomous technologies. There's just this last week a report in the New York Times where the US highlighted its concerns about China and Russia developing battle networks. Um, and meanwhile, the United States is also throwing a lot of money towards this in what it's called its third offset strategy. Even the Dutch military has said that if the Dutch armed forces are to remain technologically advanced, autonomous weapons will have to play a role now and in the future, though they also uh, reject categorically the development of so-called fully autonomous weapons. So I've been devised some of the technology just qui quickly um, recap. We're focused here on constructed systems, those built by humans that provide, especially the, uh, that are fueled by these underlying algorithms, that, especially ones that provide for a learning algorithm or learning architecture, which Nas will go into more discussion about, because the primary concern we have is the ability of these constructed systems to help make and give effect to an underlying choice, in quotes, or a decision that previously would have been reposed in a human. Uh, so again, the main concern for us is this, this question of whether or not that choice um, should be reposed in the human, what it means to be reposed in the human, what it means to have quote unquote human machine teaming, and really what it means to have accountability in this context. Accountability not being a term of art, but one that we thought is a useful lens through which to examine this to, and to link the technical elements alongside of the international uh, law elements. As many of you know, in 2013, following a, a report in 2012, the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots uh, was launched. And this has been a very important driver of the uh, concerns and bringing them to the international political level. And we'll very briefly show a clip of one of the campaign's initial uh, videos. When I say killer robot, probably the first thing that springs to mind is some fight scene out of a science fiction action movie. You might think, awesome idea, or nah, not really my thing. But did you know that precursors to killer robots are actually being developed right now? Killer robots are robotic weapons that choose and fire on targets, all of their own accord, without any human intervention. Sounds pretty crazy, right? Well, their predecessors are already active. Take the US X-47B the first unmanned aerial vehicle to take off and land at sea. So we can drop into the chat the link to the rest of this video. The main point is that the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots has galvanized support among certain groups of technologists, uh, as well as um, human rights advocates, ethicists, and lawyers. And they received an enormous boost from uh, thousands of robotics researchers and AI researchers in July of 2015 uh, who endorsed an open letter on autonomous weapons, arguing that the key question for humanity today is whether to start a global arms race or to prevent it from starting. Those endorsing the letter, quote, believe that artificial intelligence has great potential to benefit humanity in many ways, and the goal of the field should be to do so. Yet they caution that starting a military AI arms race is a bad idea and should be prevented by a ban on offensive autonomous weapons beyond meaningful human control. This term, by the way, meaningful human control, has become uh, something of great focus within the context of what's called the CCW, which we'll talk about later. And what exactly the parameters of quote unquote meaningful human control mean is an area of ongoing debate and discussion. So far, there have been um, 14 states that have um, 
indicated that they're favorably disposed toward a ban on fully autonomous weapons. Um, but I uh, quickly hasten to add that it's not clear exactly what fully autonomous weapons means in this context, though there does seem to be more and more consensus. And as we'll discuss later, this December, next month, might be a very important moment as to whether governments decide to go forward with the regulation um, and with the potential ban on fully autonomous weapons, however decided. Yet at the same time, there's been also a stream of uh, commentators who have supported, uh, uh, been in more favor of a regulating autonomous weapons primarily through existing international rules and provisions. These voices often focus on grounding the discourse in terms of the capability of existing legal norms, especially those laid down in IHL, to regulate the design, development, and use, or even to prohibit the use of these emergent technologies. In doing so, the commentators often emphasize that states have already developed a relatively thick set of international law rules that guide decisions about life and death in war. And even if there's no specific treaty addressing a particular weapon, they argue, IHL regulates the use of all weapons through general rules and principles governing the conduct of hostilities in armed conflict. So the way we see it is that there's five key debate axes with respect to autonomous weapons. First is the general issue of decision-making in war. Are humans or machines or a combination of humans and machines better positioned to be able to make the types of decisions we think are important and should be subject to regulation or potentially even prohibited by international law or other norms? Second, there are, we have a, there's a discussion about what the benefits and costs are of distancing human fighters from the battlefield. There certainly are both benefits and costs, and I think from the different starting points, you might come to very different conclusions about whether or not this is good or bad. There's also concern with respect to offsetting possible life-saving benefits by the fact that war may become easier to conduct or easier to start at the outset uh, next, there's been different understandings and predictions of what the machines will be capable of. This is an enormous concern that we have and one where the scientists and the technical experts don't agree on what the uh, machines and what these constructed systems and algorithms are going to be capable of. And that makes it quite a bit harder to be able to then identify how best to regulate the systems. And then lastly, and this has been the heart of the discussion within the CCW and other uh, context is the sufficiency of the current legal frameworks concerning accountability and whether or not we'll be able to have meaningful account accountability with respect to autonomy, autonomous technologies in relation to war. The two big challenges that we see, and we'll provide links to how you might be able to develop your technical competency later. The first one is the sheer technical complexity. These are extremely complex uh, technical matters, and it's often a debate among experts uh, occluded in part by the commercial development atmosphere where due to intellectual property and other concerns, it's not always clear even where the technology exists. Um, and then second, states as well as others uh, commenting on these issues disagree on what should be addressed to begin with. So there's been a focus in uh, some sectors primarily on weapons and in other sectors on many other elements, including the things like telesurgery or robots involved in other forms of medical care about how to ensure that medical uh, functions as well as other functions alongside of the conduct of hostilities is subject to a meaningful set of legal uh, regulation. As we mentioned earlier, the uh, certain convention on conventional weapons framework has been, or the CCW has been the primary framework that states have addressed these issues so far. This, however, limits the discussion primarily to weapons. Quite understandably, of course, given the importance of weapons, their lethality and their destructive capability, but doing so really narrows the discussion primarily to weapons. This December, states are going to uh, have in front of them whether they want to endorse a so-called group of governmental experts um, and to go forward with a more specific process with respect to fully autonomous weapons within the context of the CCW. But of course, we also have state responsibility frameworks more generally, and in the report, we highlight a number of areas where the notion of state responsibility uh, might fit autonomous technologies well, but it also might be frustrated, might frustrate attempts to regulate autonomous technologies. 
people focus also more generally on just IHL itself. So does the framework of IHL already provide sufficient uh, level of clarity and specificity when it comes to regulating existing technical framework, uh, existing technologies and emergent technologies? And there's enormous amount of debate about whether weapons reviews and other provisions of IHL alongside the more general provisions concerning the conduct of hostilities, humanitarian aid and assistance, already are sufficient to be able to address any of these emergent technologies. Uh, there's been a, something of a focus too on the ability of international criminal law to be able to address the concerns raised by autonomous technologies, especially autonomous weapons. Uh, the international criminal law framework raises the bar in a way, especially with res compared to state responsibility, because international criminal law is based on individual responsibility for international crimes, and those are uh, sometimes quite a bit higher in terms of the indicia needed to prove in order to ensure that a violation can be proven. Lastly, there's been a move by some um, within the industries themselves to be able to self-regulate. So here you'll see the technical communities themselves deciding to self-regulate. And in the report, we mentioned that they might be able to draw the engineers, the AI specialists, the roboticists, and others might be able to draw from the recent experience of what's called CRISPR-Cas9. This is a form of genetic engineering that uh, about a year ago, the world's leading scientists on this decided to impose self-regulations and to self-police the resulting boundaries. And we think this might be a good model that combines these other elements of the CCW framework for those seeking to address fully autonomous weapons through a prohibition or a ban alongside of more general frameworks of state responsibility um, through IHL, through international criminal law, and then through this question of industry self-regulation. So to sum up, uh, from my part before shifting over to Nas, our research left us, um, after reviewing the literature, reviewing the state positions, with a concern that it was very difficult to tell what exactly was up for being addressed. So we focused on three questions. What can be regulated? What should be regulated? and how it should be regulated when it comes to forms of increasing technical autonomy in relation to armed conflict. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Naz Modirzadeh, to discuss how we thought, what the approach that we put forward, uh, the so-called war algorithms. Great, thank you so much, Dustin, uh, and thanks for that incredibly succinct uh, summary of hundreds of pages of research work. Um, what I'd like to do now is to very briefly say a word about uh, PLAC's approach and sort of our context and background coming into this issue to actually explain this strange term that we've been using from the outset, war algorithms, uh, and then just to highlight briefly some of the dilemmas that we think um, remain on this issue and that will prove exceptionally challenging for both international lawyers and also those developing the technologies underlying uh, many of these weapons and the broader question of autonomy and armed conflict. And as I suggested, I'll conclude with some reflections on what this might mean for humanitarian actors before we open it up. And I'm cognizant of time, so I'll try to be uh, quite brief in my reflections. Um, Generally, and overall, PLAC's work uh, seeks to focus on areas of international law in armed conflict where there are significant questions or international law dilemmas where objective, neutral research can be helpful in illuminating the key legal dilemmas and possible solutions to those legal dilemmas for policymakers, decision makers, and international law practitioners and academics more generally. So we do not take positions, we do not engage in advocacy, and we do not set out uh, policy prescriptions that PLAC believes it should be promoting. Uh, our, the reason we got into this issue was that we had a sense, and Dustin nicely laid out the, the debate here over uh, banning uh, fully autonomous weapons or regulating them, we had the sense that this was a very pitched battle, that increasingly there was very little genuine dialogue or curiosity regarding what were the problems we are all facing in thinking about this issue, and much more a sense that one needed to either be committed to the notion of a full preemptive ban on fully autonomous weapons, or to argue that IHL, as it currently is drafted, is 
entirely capable and flexible enough to address this new technology. Our sense was that this battle, while important and politically salient, was not particularly helpful in actually leading us to understand the underlying international law dilemmas. And second, as we dug into the research, we found that multiple interlocutors were using the phrase autonomous weapon systems to mean entirely different things. More and more we saw that advocates researchers, state parties, and others were referring to autonomous weapons, and in fact, they seemed to mean very different things. And so as we progressed in the research, we increasingly had the sense that autonomous weapon systems, or AWS, as they're frequently called in the literature, advocacy, and uh, legal uh, documents, was not actually a very helpful way of thinking about the much deeper and more significant issue, at least as we saw it. Our sense was that weapons and weapon systems are not, in fact, the real challenge to international law and its capacity to regulate, but rather algorithms. And the role of algorithms and increased machine autonomy in armed conflict far beyond weapon systems themselves. So we proposed and developed the, a new framework, one that we call war algorithms. It's uh, even for people like myself who have no science or technology background, it's a relatively um, simple concept. An algorithm, so ingredient number one for a war algorithm is that you have an algorithm, uh, essentially a system where you have an input a series of computational pathways developed by a human programmer, and then an output or outputs that the algorithm develops through these computational pathways. Second, a constructed system. So a constructed system is basically a manufactured thing. It is a non-biological thing. So it could be a robot that looks sort of animal-like as we saw in Spot Mini, but it could also be a circle, a square, a car, lots and lots of other manufactured things. Our sense is that these are the key ingredients in the kinds of technology that will provide significant challenges to existing international law in armed conflict in the decades to come, as opposed to the narrower concept of autonomous weapons systems. Uh, our view of the technology is that it will quickly surpass the notions of weapons themselves and move into all kinds of other domains that may be relevant to armed conflict, such as detention, care for detainees, medical care in armed conflict, uh, decisions as to how to calculate proportionality or precautionary measures, intelligence gathering, and the intelligence that may inform the decisions of human commanders. Uh, you have in front of you a page of math. Uh, let me explain why that's here. Uh, these are some of the equations underlying the AlphaGo program that Dustin discussed earlier, Google Minds um, algorithm that ultimately beat uh, Lee Sedol and a number of other uh, Go master players. Um, the reason we've included this here is, is simply to say that these building blocks for the algorithms require numbers, they require concrete information to be put into a computational model and an algorithm. But increasingly what we find is that the new artificial intelligence that is being developed engages in something called machine learning. Now what does this mean? It means unlike a computer program where we might say here is input X, here is the computational pathway, and you will develop output Y. Machine learning involves algorithms that are at a level of advancement and sophistication that they are actually exploring and learning on their own. The programmers are providing inputs and data to the machines, but the algorithms are at a level of complexity that they are essentially able to engage in neural processes that may mimic the activities of the human brain and, of course, beyond. So increasingly, scientists and technologists working on these areas are finding that the programmer who created the algorithm, using equations like the one we saw previously, may not be able to predict 
the ways in which the algorithm will explore the data and information that has been provided for it. Now, let me make this a bit more concrete. What I think this means is that while we can understand what it would look like to teach, for example, a Google car to drive well. So we might say, we're going to give the Google car one million different examples of a good and safe drive from the PHAP headquarters to the United Nations. You take these roads, these are the lights, this is how a good driver would drive that road. And we know that the Google car and its machine learning will take in all of these best examples and use those to learn how to drive well from PHAP headquarters to the United Nations. Or in AlphaGo, they put in front of AlphaGo, in front of these computational pathways, hundreds of thousands of winning Go matches so that the computer could learn based on outstanding play. How do we do that in armed conflict? What do we teach the machines? Do we take examples from the recent wars in Afghanistan? Do we take examples from the war in Iraq? Do we put 50 generals in a room and say, you are the ones who have fought well, so we're going to give the computer your behavior and choices? Um, it's, it, or do we simply say any campaign that has not resulted in a war crimes prosecution, that's good enough to put into the algorithm? It's very difficult to imagine what this looks like in armed conflict. And secondly, how do we use international humanitarian law in this manner? So ultimately, if an algorithm is going to be programmed to uh, act in a targeting capacity or in a detention capacity, it needs to know what is the calculus of proportionality. Uh, someone is going to put a series of equations to that. And how do they do that and what ought to guide them seem like very complex and difficult uh, questions. And then, of course, ultimately, when these are put into constructed systems that can make choices, that's where this will become a live issue in the battlefield and for civilians, combatants, and humanitarian actors alike. Okay, I'm just going to take a moment to focus in on some of these dilemmas, and then I will close um, with a reflection or two on the implications for humanitarian actors. Uh, as I said, I think this, the question of learning and how international humanitarian law connects to machine learning as these algorithms engage in a host of activities in armed conflict that may go far beyond weapons uh, remains a central question uh, that in our sense has not been answered well by the existing literature. And of course that learning is deeply connected to accountability. As Dustin pointed out, you need to have a sense of what the standards are and to whom or what they apply before you can have a measure of accountability. Uh, second is the notion of auditing. So algorithms uh, can have a auditable a nature where essentially there is a track record of every code that has been put into the program. And would this provide an opportunity to actually think through the responsibilities involved in teaching, training, and guiding on international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict uh, in, in an actual battlefield scenario? Uh, third, the question of how do we bound this discussion? So if we're talking about weapons, uh, what counts as an autonomous weapon? If we are talking about the much broader role of algorithms and autonomy in armed conflict, what counts as the thing that we are concerned about and how do we define the boundaries of this uh, inquiry? Uh, fourth, as I think I've already intimated, but I'll say it explicitly here, anyone who is a serious student of international humanitarian law is well aware that this body of law purposely has a built in a considerable amount of flexibility and vagueness. You can see this if you look at the first additional protocol, you can see this if you pick up any military manual, and you can certainly see this if you look at rules of engagement for soldiers um, in the battle space. How does that vagueness and flexibility, which many argue is a feature of this body of law and makes it pragmatic and practical, what does that look like when we start to code 
that body of law. And my sense is anyone who argues you can simply turn the Geneva Conventions into a set of equations uh, is perhaps profoundly overestimating the clarity of those conventions. Uh, and finally, the current approach of international criminal law raises some dilemmas and questions regarding how this would be applied to uh, algorithms and those responsible for the programming and development of algorithms. Okay, so let me close on the question of implications for humanitarian actors. I think there's the very obvious one and then there's the perhaps less obvious. The very obvious, it seems to me, is things like the KMAX helicopter that we saw, right? So technologies that would actually be brought into crises and situations of armed conflict to conduct the very activities that humanitarian actors are currently conducting. So what would our reaction be, for example, if there was an autonomous technology that could loiter in the air indefinitely for days, weeks, and months, would select an area that was safest for landing, and then would deliver massive amounts of aid? So not the current small drones that are being experimented with in places like Syria that have a very small payload that they can carry in, but far, far larger uh, swarms of autonomous um, vehicles that could carry in humanitarian supplies. What if, for example, something like Spot Mini was able to provide basic triage and medical care uh, in a clinic environment? So what if there was a situation as dangerous as that uh, in and around Aleppo or Mosul right now where there would be a group of spot minis that would go in and provide succor to the sick and the wounded? Is that something we would be comfortable with? Uh, it's certainly on the horizon that technology is moving in that direction. So that may be the way in which autonomy actually is doing some humanitarian work. More abstractly, what about the role of autonomy and war algorithms in, for example, collecting data and information about individuals, uh, civilians, or uh, potential beneficiaries? Uh, what about the role of algorithms and autonomy in determining levels of humanitarian need and prioritizing recipients? Uh, to what extent will we soon see the role of algorithms in actually shaping the way we think about aid, assistance, and need-based humanitarian um, action. Uh, what if autonomy and algorithms in particular are able to play a role in identifying and understanding um, ways in which we might make choices around protection of civilians? Uh, these questions, I think, are not science fiction. They're very close at hand, and it's very clear that those working on this technology foresee uh, the increasing ability of these constructed systems working off of algorithms to do all kinds of things that previously only humans could do. Um, and so for humanitarian actors, I think there's the question of how do you deal with the use of these systems by the armed forces, but also to what extent are we prepared within the humanitarian community to have a conversation about the role of algorithms in humanitarian work itself. With that, I'll close and hand it back over to our hosts, and hopefully we can uh, engage with the audience and answer some questions. OK, excellent. Thank you so much, Naz. And thanks, Dustin, for the presentations. Uh, we do have several questions that have come in. Um, Sasha and I will be uh, taking turns back and forth here, posing questions, and I'll begin. I have one uh, that's come in for Naz first. Uh, so following up on. Um, the points you're making regarding proportionality calculations, uh, you had called it a, I think it, your words were complex and difficult task. Are there, just to clarify, are there currently um, legal arguments being put forward that it is actually impossible to reduce proportionality to a calculation that could be completed by a machine? Are there, are there currently arguments that the law requires um, the involvement of the subjective human perspective? Over to you, Ness. 
Fantastic question. Absolutely is my answer. And they are quite compelling arguments. So I'll try to summarize the argument uh, and then say why we might find it compelling. So essentially the argument goes like this. Um, the judgments involved in making a choice about how to take human lives and the judgments involved in deciding who should be detained or not are essentially fundamentally human judgments. And the law requires, not explicitly, but implicitly, that those decisions and choices are made not just by humans, but by commanders who have been trained in IHO, and at least according to AP1, actually have a legal advisor working with them to make these choices. Uh, so the argument says everything about the law tells us that the fundamental underlying assumption is People who have been taught the law are making these choices and decisions, and it is those people who will be responsible if those choices result in violations or war crimes. Um, and that argument often is used as the basis to say this is why there can never be fully autonomous weapons making choices and decisions about taking human lives in the battlefield because machines can never have uh, the complex and nuanced and moral human judgment that is involved in making these choices. So we might find that compelling either because we just agree on a, on a human level that that has to be right, but we also might find that compelling legally and say uh, the, the law assumes that this is a human and not a device or a machine that is making that decision. And for that reason, one might argue that any weapon that can take life must be controlled always and forever by a human being. Uh, I'll just very briefly caricature out the opposing argument. The opposing argument might go something like this. That's very nice. What a nice emotional point you've just made, Nas. But actually, human beings are frail, weak, afraid, full of rage, racist, not the people who are making these moral choices that you are laying out. And in fact, a machine that has been programmed well is not emotional, is not afraid, is not 19 years old, and can make rational, clear choices without all of the baggage that uh, we humans have when we are in life and death situations. So that argument says that autonomy may actually lead to better outcomes fewer civilian deaths and injuries, and a far, quote unquote, cleaner war. Back over to you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to turn it over to Sasha for the next question. Thanks for such a great presentation to you both. Uh, a question has come in regarding the flexibility of the law, of international humanitarian law that you, Nas, were just mentioning. Um, is there any tension or how do the two relate in the sense that you mentioned to code the law you would need an amount of clarity that likely international humanitarian law doesn't have yet at the same time earlier you were discussing the unpredictability of how deep learning works and it would seem that that in of itself even if you had clarity in the law to program it wouldn't result in um, in clear application of the law necessarily. Uh, is there, do you see the two relating in any way or do you see them as two different things? Yes, I do think they relate and I also want to be careful here to, to stay in my lane of expertise in the sense that um, I think all of us who have expertise in anything are, are get very um, nervous when people start to speak beyond their understanding and I'm quite close to that line. So I should say I am not an AI technologist and I am not deeply familiar with the ways in which this technology is built. But my sense is that scientists and technologists are very concerned about this. And if you look at the letter uh, signed by thousands of leading scientists that Dustin referred to, one of their concerns is clearly that as AI develops, uh, it will indeed outpace the programmer's ability to predict its actions, and surely that is a concern in the arena of uh, the battlefield and IHL. Thank you. Uh, on, on a related question, um, 
Oh, sorry. Thank you. I had my mute button on. Uh, another question is, Dustin, you mentioned that you would provide some links for how to develop your technical uh, knowledge earlier. Uh, and I wondered if you could provide those as you've both identified issues um, in, the, in this complex arena and mentioned that a part of the problem is a lack of, techno of technical knowledge on the part of states, lawyers, decision, decision makers, et cetera. Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. Absolutely. So I'll drop back into the chat a number of the links. My recommendation is that um, folks who have no experience with it whatsoever start with what I'll, I'll label as the visual introduction to deep learning. It's very, um, it's actually, it's a beautiful website that goes through and shows you the, the, int the most basic elements of machine learning. Um, and then I'll also provide some links to free MIT courses as well as some Coursera courses that you can walk through and learn some of the basic underlying concepts of algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning. You'll hear things like neural networks, et cetera. Um, and for those who have a bit more of a programming or perhaps more sophisticated technical approach, I'll also link to something um, about simple programming problems to be able to think more and more computationally. I would really quickly note, though, that these are the types of things that are basic intros to the um, these systems, and ones, though, that I think if lawyers want to be able, or others who are interested in the ethical and legal and accountability elements of technical autonomy and armed conflict, um, should try to be able to carve out time to undertake these uh, research on their own. If you don't understand how fundamentally an algorithm is expressed in computer code, it's going to be very difficult to be able to formulate a sophisticated approach to accountability from a legal, ethical, or other perspective. But definitely, I will drop those right back into the, the chat now. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, actually, Dustin, I have one more f uh, question for you. This is uh, coming in from Anis in Tunisia. Uh, so building on uh, what you had mentioned previously um, regarding moves among industry actors to self-regulate, uh, Anis is asking, is it possible uh, under current legal frameworks to regulate the industry from the outside? Is it actually possible to impose accountability in the industry, or is self-regulation regulation actually the only option currently available? Excellent question. So the my sense is that it's certainly possible for at the domestic level and even at the international level to impose standards, rules, laws on the industry. However, the difficulty that one might face is um, uh, threefold. The first is that to be effective, it would need to be of a global character. So you need to be able to get industries that might have artificial intelligence firms based in China and in the United States and in Israel or Russia or South Korea. And to be able to get those, all of those countries to be able to adopt their own domestic standards would be very difficult, I think. So it'd have to be global response in general. Second one is that there's um, very little interest in some states in regulating this right now because they see a huge amount of potential commercial and military value in developing AI in ways that the programmers would not be subject to as strict of re regulation. Um, but then the third one is that, yes, definitely there's ways to impose these regulations even short of law just through things like policies, funding, et cetera, and providing conditions so that when you obtain a Department of Defense, Department of State, or other uh, side of funding, that those policies are, are imposed on the community such that it's a top-down form of regulation. In the report we mentioned, and I'll end on this, is that there's a way to adopt from previous generations of technologists ways to code law. Uh, Larry Lessig is famous for this notion of being able to code law. In other words, to be able to design from an engineering perspective uh, and develop normative frameworks into the technical architecture. And I think this is an area that should be of greater focus than it is already. And of course, alongside of all of the other initiatives that are being undertaken, whether at the international, regional, or domestic, or even transnational level within the uh, developer or commercial communities. 
All right. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Uh, really interesting presentations again, and also discussions. Some uh, great questions that came in. So thanks also um, to all of you who were actively participating uh, here in the virtual room. We've come to the end of our time, um, so I would like to uh, start the the closing procedure by uh, giving the floor one more time to to Naz and to Dustin for our brief uh, concluding remarks. If you have any thoughts you would like to leave with us today. Great. So I will, Naz and I are in the same room, so I will say what she said, which is that we don't have any further concluding remarks except to say thanks again to the PAP team. And if there are any further remarks, uh, critical or otherwise, to the report, we would welcome them. And we very much hope that we have spurred interest in this such that maybe in a few months from now, we could all get together, a, you know, some sort of digital Google shared space to be able to code some normative frameworks into some AI systems. So thanks every, very much, everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks to you both. And we look forward to next time. Um, I'd like to inform all of you participating today that a recording of today's session will be available in the coming days. That will be on the event page on the PHAP website. And uh, you can also access uh, the various resources that have been mentioned in the chat, which are already there on the event page at the link you see on the screen in front of you. Um, I'll also highlight a couple of uh, upcoming events that we have. So we actually have another expert briefing in our humanitarian law and policy series coming up on the 8th of November. That will be with Bonnie Doherty from Harvard Law School looking at her recent research carried out on the determination of hostile intent. Uh, so please do join us uh, for that briefing and you can read more about it and register at the link uh, on your screen. We will also have um, as well in the humanitarian law and policy track, but in our learning session series, um, a session on the 15th of November with Gabor Rona, who's a visiting professor at Cardozo Law School. And he'll be walking us through the legal dilemma of detention in the context of non-international armed conflicts. Uh, so please do consider joining us for that as well. And of course, sharing um, the information about these upcoming events uh, with any colleagues of yours who may also be interested in participating. Um, I'd like to really thank again all of our participants for their active involvement. I'll pass the floor one more time to my co-host, Sasha Radin, um, for uh, any closing remarks from her side. Thanks a lot to you, Naz and Dustin, and also to everyone else who has participated. And thanks to PHAP for the opportunity to co-host. It's been really interesting. Great. Thank, and thanks so much to you uh, for your help today, Sasha. Um, with my final comment, I'll just invite all of you participating to fill in the survey uh, that will appear when we close the event. Uh, as you know, we have a very active calendar uh, of these online sessions and are very eager to look at your inputs um, and uh, actively uh, put that into our planning um, for 2017. Uh, so this is Inherit Lang and the rest of the team here at PHAP signing off from Geneva. Until next time.